in order to exist as a living system in order to have form and to like to have some kind of structure that's relatively separate from the world around you need to be you need to attempt to know what's going on around you otherwise you're just going to get demolished by all the forces in the world that you know that demolish all the things that aren't alive right um and this this is not currently the kind of way that most people think about consciousness in the kind of scientific and philosophical mainstream we have this like hangover from uh well it's the kind of whole lineage of western thought where we we kind of assume that single-celled organisms are just little mechanisms they're like little clockwork things that just kind of do their thing and it's a very kind of um it's a view that really takes away any of the kind of awe at what a like vast universe of complexity like a single cell is you know so you you'll hear scientists on the one hand almost dismiss plants and single cells as these boring little mechanisms and yeah, on the other hand, we like life is the kind of one of the greatest mysteries in the world. And, and we're talking about life when we talk about a bacteria or a single cell, right? Um, so, so yeah, my the the simple way of, of saying the theory is exactly as you said that it's really as simple as every living system, uh, which is a system that actively keeps itself together, actively perpetuates its its form. It has to attempt to know what's going on in its environment. It needs to know of itself in its environment. Um, and this is just another way of saying consciousness. It, it kind of, yeah, it constructs beliefs about what's going on in, like, in existence, in, in kind of a qualitative picture of the world. Um, and this is, we're talking now at a kind of conceptual level, but which is how it first came to me. But then it turns out if you, if you dig into the kind of hard like physics and like statistical physics and maths behind the thermodynamics of life, it's there. The same stuff is there. You can unpack it at that level as well. And it was, it was that, when I saw that, I was like, okay, like this is, this I, I, this isn't just hand waving, you know, saying, oh, maybe, maybe that's how where consciousness is. It's, it, I'm I'm utterly convinced now that this is. No, someone's opinion may contradict yours. Where's my friend Alan? It's all about your perspective. Who are we, and what is the nature of this reality? What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. Very pumped for this episode. We are going to be talking about the living mirror theory of consciousness. We have Dr. James Cook joining us on the show. Hi, James. Hey there. It's great to be here. Thanks for coming on the program. I'm very pumped for this episode. For those that don't know James's background, he's a neuroscientist, writer, and speaker focusing on consciousness, meditation, psychedelic states, reconciling science and spirituality. He posits the living mirror theory of consciousness, that all living things need to know their world. He splits his time between London and the mountains of Portugal, where he's building a retreat center, the Surrender Homestead. You can find his links in the bio below, drjamescook.com. Also, his YouTube page is having, having great interviews right now and great content. Check that out. And he's writing on Reality Sandwich. All those links are in the bio below. James, let's start things off with obviously you and I are both extremely passionate about the synthesis of science and spirituality, metaphysics, understanding the nature of reality, the nature of consciousness. We're taking at it from such similar and also slightly different perspectives, which is, this is going to be an epic back and forth on that. I loved the learning about the living mirror theory of consciousness and especially the understanding from from what I understood from your video, I liked the fact that you went all the way back to what you could say is a biogenesis and just the, the idea that you, you can't divide uh, the cell from the cell's understanding of its environment. Those two things are coupled together. If you don't divide those things, you understand the unity of everything. But that's this general idea is that the the living system needs to understand its world. Will you take us through that, that process and elaborate a bit? Yeah, definitely. And so the way you said it is, is perfect. Like the fact that in order to exist as a living system, in order to have form and to, like, to have some kind of structure that's relatively separate from the world around, you need to be, 
you need to attempt to know what's going on around you. Otherwise, you're just going to get demolished by all the forces in the world that, you know, that demolish all the things that aren't alive, right? Um, and this, this is not currently the kind of way that most people think about consciousness in the kind of scientific and philosophical mainstream. We have this like hangover from, uh, well, it's the kind of whole lineage of Western thought where we, we kind of assume that single celled organisms are just little mechanisms. They're like little clockwork things that just kind of do their thing. And it's a very kind of, um, it's a view that really takes away any of the kind of awe at what a like vast universe of complexity, like a single cell is, you know, so you, you'll hear scientists on the one hand, almost dismiss plants and single cells as these boring little mechanisms. And yet on the other hand, we like life is the kind of one of the greatest mysteries in the world. And, and we're talking about life when we talk about a bacteria or a single cell, right? Um, so, so yeah, my, the, the simple way of, of saying the theory is exactly as you said, that it's really as simple as every living system, uh, which is a system that actively keeps itself together, actively perpetuates its, its form. It has to attempt to know what's going on in its environment. It needs to know of itself in its environment. Um, and this is just another way of saying consciousness. It, it kind of, it, it constructs beliefs about what's going on in, like in existence, in, in kind of a qualitative picture of the world. Um, and this is, we're talking now at a kind of conceptual level, but which is how it first came to me. But then it turns out if you, if you dig into the kind of hard like physics and like statistical physics and maths behind the thermodynamics of life, it's there. The same stuff is there. You can unpack it at that level as well. And it was, it was that, when I saw that, I was like, okay, like this is, this, I, I, this isn't just hand waving, you know, saying, oh, maybe, maybe that's how where consciousness is. It's, it, I'm, I'm utterly convinced now that this is the, um, as you say, abiogenesis, the moment that life pops into existence, that is the moment that consciousness pops into existence, because then you have a system that can be aware. Before then, everything is just truly one system where everything is dissolving into everything else. And you can't really point to an object and say, is that conscious? Because you know, we can label a rock in the ocean as a rock in the ocean, but really there's no boundary there. It's just being dissolved and everything's just kind of, you know, um, melting into each other in this kind of, in this kind of single thing we call physical reality. And so you can't even say is a rock conscious, but you can point to the pattern of life and say, is that conscious? Um, so th there's also, I, th I think that's something I've not spoken about in public, but I think it's quite a powerful way of thinking about this. Life forms with life forms, you can even, you can ask if they're conscious. With everything else, you can't even really ask if it's conscious. In the ultimate nature of this infinite consciousness, this God, this source, this implicate, whatever the, that we want to use as that, as the main metaphysical uh, truth, that within that ocean is that infinite, is a whirlpool. And we've been using this whirlpool analogy that there's this whirlpool, which is the abiogenesis for the whole planet. And then there are these whirlpools for all 8 billion human creatures as well. And that the whirlpool itself is the formation of the, the, the coupling of the, uh, the, the, the single celled, organism at the first time to its environment the coupling of that there needs to be a ledger mechanism in a sense like i i really like using a ledger or um idea because the cell itself has a ledger when we've had a uh, dr chow tong on the show and he is extremely obsessed with these 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 the mathematics of understanding cells because they do have a cycle they have a a schedule for mitosis they 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 must know they have a protein buildup that signals to them at which point it's safe to divide um given their memory and their history and so there without a doubt the same idea applies to us do i have enough resources right now for me to procreate if the answer is no i'm i'm not going to procreate there will not be uh mating and uh and further the recursive function of making more humans and so the this this idea that your life is is inextricably connected to the to to your environment and now did you choose the word 
um, mirror because of how it's all in a sense we talk about this so much in in spiritual world where if it is just this one consciousness that is having the the symphonic experience through all eight billion artists and that there's that we're all in a sense mirrors of the same source and so is that the idea that both the mirror of the individual and their environment like that there's that coupling together of the of the ledger of the person in their environment, but also the mirroring of all 8 billion of us of that source. Yeah. So, so I would say that the, um, the word mirror is referring to a kind of property of the living system, but the consciousness itself is like a reflection. So if you want to understand a reflection, you know, the, the analogy would be for neuroscientists trying to understand consciousness by just looking at the brain in isolation, it would be like studying the surface of a mirror, and trying to figure out what all these patterns are. Like you can't, if you refuse to think about photons and you refuse to think about how they reflect off of other surfaces that then get reflected in the mirror, then you're not gonna understand what, what a reflection is. It's, it's something that can only be understood as a process arising in this, in this very zoomed out picture where you're considering the photons, you're considering the, the surface properties of the mirror. Um, and so similarly with, with living systems, when you zoom out and you see living systems as, as you say, a kind of whirlpool, as a pattern in reality um, that perpetuates itself, a feature of those patterns is that there's this kind of informational reflection of the structure of the world around the system inside it. And this is kind of what consciousness is, I would say. Um, and I think it's, to go back to, um, you were, you were saying the kind of the source or the kind of, you know, I, I might call it the kind of the ground of being, right? If we mm -hmm. get into this kind of these metaphysical questions, um, part of the reason people have found it hard to think about the place of consciousness in nature uh, is kind of articulated by something called the hard problem of consciousness, which can be thought of in a few different ways. But one way of thinking about it is as a metaphysical problem that you've got the kind of hard matter that makes up the world. And then you, that's a kind of substance that exists. And then you've got mind, which is kind of another substance, and somehow you've got a map between the two. Uh, if you look at, you know, prior to this kind of um, this scientific narrative that the world is made of little material building blocks, most kind of you know, spiritual traditions have this idea that the ground of being is something utterly beyond our concepts. You can call it matter, you can call it consciousness, you can call it whatever you want, but it's it's utterly it's the ground of like the territory is so much greater and vaster than the map. The, these little words we say are nothing in, in the face of the kind of the, the source of, of existence. Dan Fajal so like people saying, use a word like God. Dan Fajal likes saying that we're crickets imagining the big game. Yeah. <laughs> exactly right. And so that's why God is actually, you know, coming from a kind of scientist who's not a kind of um, a theist or, or anything. Like the word, the word God is useful because it points to the fact that, well, what does God mean? It's another word, but it points to something utterly beyond words, right? Utterly transcendent, imminent and everything. Um, and so I actually have a kind of pet peeve, I think, in, in, in the kind of spiritual communities when we use the word consciousness for the kind of, um, for this ground of being, because mm. we're, we're now just, instead of say, instead of really sitting with the fact that the ground of being is truly beyond words, if we say it's consciousness, then we're kind of, it feels like we, it, it's tempting to give it a label right but i think it can get confusing because i would say if you think the ground of being is consciousness then you would think in that perspective that and at the big bang there was some experience i'm saying the kind of ground of being is some mysterious process and the big bang was not a conscious event it was it was unconscious kind of things happening um and consciousness exists in these kind of reflections of living of living, living systems so it's it's not that everything is in consciousness in, in my world view um, but it's important to understand that uh, the world isn't divided fundamentally into matter and mind. Everything is process. Everything is just this, this kind of strange creative thing unfolding, which mm -hmm. is what we see in quantum mechanics. If you try and say, where is that subatomic particle? Good luck. It's nowhere. <laughs> it doesn't have a, lo a pre-existing location because you're part of this kind of web of co-creation, you know, and what we call matter is not this pre-existing stage. It's this this kind of yeah this process that gets co-created and consciousness is also a process and so i think that's why you can author scientific theories of consciousness because all sciences is another map it's a map of the territory and we can come up with a map that describes how matter behaves we can come up with a map that describes how consciousness behaves and how they fit together and i, I see no problem there yeah beautiful so 
we are constantly trying to make better and better maps of the reality yet the the most simple way to say it is that there is a an indescribable this ineffable um and then there is that the, and there's a creative likely likely an a, an eternal creative unfolding um and that the unfolding has a feedback mechanism and the, the and that feedback mechanism is this this co-creative uh ability f for us to um, out of all of the infinite potential that you have as an artist that you get to pick what you want to uh unfold in the in out of the infinite uh potential what you want to collapse what you want to become so okay so an eternal creative process now the the reason why it's tempting I think to put to subsume cosmogony in consciousness or infinite consciousness is because there is no in a sense nothing else besides this experience that we are having and that in a sense consciousness is the tool that we use as from whatever perspective of that God or source or whatever you want to call that from that indescribable, we use consciousness as the tool to experience ourselves. I think my, um, so maybe my, my take on this is that maybe, you know, it might be because I'm a scientist that I, I want the problem for me of, of, of consciousness and also just as an individual who meditates and does this other stuff. The problem for me is accounting for, this particular thing that is like it's private it's this qualitative space of, of awareness that, that's here right now and you have it right and we're going to give that the label consciousness and we're going to face this as a problem like where does that emerge in nature right so that's that's one thing if if all of existence is in consciousness or it has consciousness or it is conscious that's it could be a similar kind of thing but but i think it won't have exactly the same properties it presumably Fair. doesn't have like a boundary and inside and outside pri like privacy. oh yeah so perhaps oh yeah it's yeah oh so yeah there, it could be something related but we so we you know we could come up with a speculative or metaphysical idea of of the infinite consciousness but then there's organism consciousness yeah yeah um and oh, we can talk good. about those differently right oh interesting yeah. okay so as uh you know rupert spira talks about this and bernardo castrop does as well there's the screen the infinite screen of of consciousness or awareness and then on it is all of the all of these little perforated like dissociative um private uh consciousnesses and that uh organism consciousness as you said and uh, i like i kind of like that you know if we were to make some sort of a division of this one into two it would be interesting to do it like a a metaphysical consciousness that's indescribable and then like a little private or organisms consciousness in the whirlpools that's kind of interesting yeah Okay. And that, yeah, that kind of takes I, I, it from a scientific side as well. It, 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 and I, I, yeah, yeah. Which is very important. I, I agree with this uh, process. I, I s totally agree. I, I've lived too um, much in San Francisco and uh, the Bay Area is like spiritual esque community where there is a very strong um, tendency to um, kind of just go with whatever new age impulse arises, and that it's it's very important to um, it, it both embody whatever that intuition is, but also embody the science that comes along with it. So yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, it's again, it maybe, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, if I spend my whole life in science, this might be just an interesting difference between, you know, t putting uh, our environmental factors might be what's what's kind of bringing up our, our differences. Um, yeah, our, our differences on this to on this topic. And um, I do think there's a kind of uh, fundamentally, like, I, I guess I, I've, I've always been fascinated by kind of describing uh, these things as part of nature. You know, nature is this like, you know, it's, it's almost like Spinoza had this idea, like nature is God effectively. Like it doesn't need to be a personal God with like a yeah, or yeah. anything like that, <laughs> but it's this, it's just this lawful, beautiful like thing that's, that's, that's far bigger than us. And so that's my kind of, my scientific perspective is like, 
when it comes to this kind of speculative metaphysical consciousness that might be bigger than my own consciousness, um, I guess I, I kind of have to, I, I you know, I, I don't, I guess I, I just draw the line there for myself as and saying my job as the kind of spiritually mm. engaged neuroscientist is to think about this consciousness, <laughs> but I can't, I can't speculate about, about that stuff uh, as much, but also it's because of the, my spiritual worldview is, is also like, I, you know, in, in like something like the Tao Te Ching, you like, you know, it's, it's all about how, you know, the Tao that can be named is not the eternal Tao. It's like, the, if you're going to try and describe this thing by calling it anything, if you think you've got a handle on it, you're fooling yourself. It's, it's, <laughs> it's so utterly beyond, you know, we can call it metaphysical consciousness or absolute infinite consciousness. This, this is starting to get a vibe that it sounds very big. It sounds very grand. It sounds like it's the right kind of word, but then you have to realize that it's going to be utterly, it cannot encapsulate the ground of being like, so I, I quite like the, the spiritual side of me. It just likes to kind of come up against this mystery and say like, yeah, like I don't, I can't know what this thing is. I, I think it's unknowable in its, in its essence. Um, and then the scientist in me is like, okay, do I think there's a reason to think the big bang was conscious of itself? Nah, I can't see any kind of mechanism by which that would happen. So I'm going to suspect no. And that's when you start to get into the, these kind of fascinating questions of like what we might call organism level consciousness, uh, which I guess I'm just calling consciousness. Um, yeah. This is so beautiful because it's so extremely important to embody the truth of mysterianism and the idea of the eternal Tao that can be named as not, the Tao that can be named is not the eternal Tao. The idea that the more that you both truly surrender to the essence of the nature of reality, both very important, but also simultaneously balancing that with the true scientific spiritual inquiry into what it, actually that is. And like, you know, Eric Weinstein calls it, you know, the source code or, and, you know, really uncovering what that, what that is. And, um, you know, Hilbert talked about the, the importance of, of of uncovering that like we must know and you know whatever you know bohm was so focused on uncovering whatever the implicate is and like we must know and so it's like this balance between we must know and 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 probing at it with the mysterianism yeah 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 i think i'm a big advocate for kind of reigning science in and putting it in its place when it comes to you know i i think that um you know, fundamentally, we're humans, we're here, we're having a weird experience of, of existence. And, you know, all of the kind of the feelings of awe and meaning and stuff, that's the first stuff that you experience. Then a scientist might come along and say, okay, let's try and do some clever tricks to come up with good stories that fit the world. And we do that game. And I, I fell in love with that game. I think it's wonderful. Um, you know, it clearly is, a, it works very well. It's what, what's allowing us to talk now. Yep. Um, so it clearly gives us some kind of knowledge, but it doesn't, eradicate just this immediate felt conscious sense of here we are and spiritual experience right this is for me is like the spiritual experience of of meaning and awe and and just existence comes first and then science is this quite should be this humble storyteller it should be something that you know and i guess i'm called, i'm describing science here as i would say science and philosophy like if you're going to make claims about the world try to do it as carefully and rigorously and, and uh, honestly yeah. as possible. Yeah. And I think, and I think that's why I actually am very happy to stop very stop short and say, what is the nature of, of the kind of ground of being? I don't have any tools for that. I haven't got a microscope to look at it. I haven't got philosophical tools to think about it. Um, and so I, I think I maybe stop short further short than other people would in, in speculating about what it, what it could be. And, and yeah, that's, that's just the place of, it's recognizing our limits as these kind of naked apes that came up with these funny ways to figure out the world. I would also plug here, Sri Aurobindo and the Mother Mira Alfasa talk a lot about the super irrational enigma that, that it truly is, and that it really does require a, the, when, when you use the body itself as the mechanism to intuitively tap into the nature of reality, there's going to be better and better ways to scientifically analyze the biometric correlates of these sort of awakened states. And that's going to be a very interesting way. 
for example, when someone has imperturbable peace and causeless joy, and w- that's a sign of living in the infinite. That's a sign of being God or the Tao. That's a sign of being truth and butterfly affecting it out. And that's a very you know spiritual statement. And scientists would be like, what do you mean by that? Let's do that more. And I'm like, yeah, we can. We can totally play that. That's, that's very important. We must plant flags beyond the edge of knowledge. And we must, and this is what, you know, Richard Feynman, so many other scientists have been doing this forever, is planting flags beyond what's known. And then in a sense, making a hypothesis and then testing it, which we are, we are going to do now. But the Vedic Rishis 5,000 years ago, Parmenides and Heraclitus, we're talking about guys that knew and girls that knew the nature of being at its most fundamental level by leveraging what is just existence, phenomenological awareness as what they believe to be that true nature of, of, of who we are. And, and I, think that, I think that we must, we must realize that science is that incredible tool set that, that is very important to making a map and to understanding, um, enabling incredible things like, like this. And then to also... Um, enable the other tool to to help which is in a sense this spirituality this like we like we we the, the, we can't we can't choke the god in man along the way um we have we have to enable the god and man to flourish at the same time i want to ask this this question this has been a a great back and forth there. I really liked how we talked about uh, some sort of a, um, if we were to break it into two, this like metaphysical first principled consciousness with this organism consciousness. I think that's a very interesting way to, to, to break that um, down. Let's, um, let's, let's have you explain this. So we have a living mirror theory of consciousness. We have a an, uh, something that can absolutely not be decoupled. We the 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 way that the 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 way that the individual consciousness, the private consciousness, the organism consciousness, the way that that becomes exists is literally through the fact that it must understand its world it must understand its environment and it has it has an ongoing feedback loop where it's air, food, water, um, fitness functions, always fitness functions, um, reproduction, um, ideas, ideas, ideas. What are the ideas at the top of the fitness landscape? How can I consume those ideas to make me as, as smart as possible? Um, so I can, et cetera. So is, is this kind of your general reasoning over those billions of years and how that is slowly what had been happening? Yeah, I mean, that, that's an excellent description of, of it. And, um, but what I would say is that you're right that it can't be decoupled. So the moment that life comes into existence, there's full-blown consciousness. There's full-blown awareness of an environment. And it, it wouldn't be as um, complex as ours. You know, if you don't have a retina made up of loads of cells and all this other complexity, you're, the contents are not going to be as, as complex as ours. But the fact of experience is, is the fact of experience. And to me, this is... Um, so there's no uh, change in consciousness over the course of evolution. If you could trade, if you could have your atoms rearranged into a single-celled organism, you would be experiencing the world as vividly as you are now. Um, but it'd be a very different experience, but there'd still be um, an experience of that. And I think something that's um, so in this picture, because consciousness is this kind of absolute, pristine, perfect kind of space in which all experiences arise, it even though it seems to be separated, you know, there are these different islands of consciousness right now. There's, there's at least one over here and there's, there's one where you are. The character of consciousness itself is the same. It can only ever be the same. So it's like, if you imagine, you know, as, as these creatures engaging in survival dynamics, we become very concerned with our separation. I become very concerned to differentiate myself from you and, you know, in order to survive. And so the separation becomes the really important thing. But if you try and kind of zoom out and look objectively, you can kind of imagine if we're all like soap bubbles, like we're made out of, of the same liquid, the dynamics of evolution and survival would make us obsessed with our separation, but we're all made of the same liquid. 
this consciousness is the same consciousness. It's a feature of the universe. It's not my, it's not James's consciousness. The concept of James in my head does not possess consciousness. The organism doesn't even possess consciousness because it's arising through the interaction with the environment. So it's more like you have a single universe with a sprinkling of islands of consciousness. It's like, it's like a bunch of eyes opening in one, in one organism. You know, think of the universe as this organism and where each of us is like an eye opening in it. And in that way, you can see why in this picture, consciousness is still this unified thing and you can still, um, you can, t you, you can feel yourself to be identified with that rather than your own, your own personal consciousness. And if you imagine once you have that kind of experience of realizing that, you know, this is usually described as the self being an illusion in spiritual circles, when you, when you realize that and you recognize this character of consciousness, then the moment you die, another eye will open in the universe somewhere. Right. And, and in parallel, there are now these multiple eyes opening. And mm -hmm. when you identify with, with that process, then you realize, okay, I really am that ground of being. I really am the, that, that, um, just the unfolding of the world and, and these, these eyes opening in it. Um, which I, th I think when I read texts like the Vedas and, and the Tao and, and things like this, I, um, it, to me, it, it fits with my, the worldview I'm describing. I, I guess there are some that are quite explicit about kind of mind only, only consciousness existing. But to me, I, the, I, I get the feeling that the, that the authors of these texts were seeing the same worldview where a rock doesn't have to be conscious. The big bang didn't have to be conscious if they were aware of the big bang. Um, but, it describes these these principles, you know, even reincarnation, right? If you take the Buddhist idea of reincarnation with the idea, you know, the, the central, one of the central doctrines of Buddhism is that the self is an illusion. So I don't think you can think of it as James is reincarnated, but when you have this recognition of the selflessness of consciousness, then it's like, well, what's really happening is, you know, to use Rupert Spira's term of the screen of, of perception or of consciousness, it's like there's this movie of James happening and then there might be a movie of a frog happening in parallel and then after I die as well and then a plant and the screen is always the same. I absolutely agree with that, that the character of consciousness is identical. And I think to really grasp, you know, the pace of consciousness in nature, you really need to be, need to be familiar with that. And that's why, you know, you can see it as this binary event that as soon as you have these enclosed living systems, you have consciousness. Um, instead of a lot of scientific thinking gets kind of confused with wakefulness and sleeping and like, and then thinks of levels of consciousness. And, and that's where people start mm -hmm. to think, well, maybe it gradually evolved, but then the philosophers are like, no, there's, there's no way it could have gradually evolved that that can't possibly have happened. And yeah. So I think, I think this, the kind of spiritual perspective is actually really crucial in understanding the place of the scientific picture of where consciousness fits in nature. Wow. Okay. So there's, there's a there's a coexistence that it's always so important like Shiro Bindo talked about this so much just the utter refusal to cut life in two and to divide it in two and that if you always keep it at that one and no matter how you perceive always at the one it'll always help and especially in this sense like I think that the, that the idea of an evolution just exists it just plainly is true but also at the same time again simultaneity being key where it's like obviously we didn't have a, a way to structure meaning we couldn't structure order out of the chaos as well as we do now that's just fact we just didn't have that ability to do it and now we're structuring order significantly more out of the chaos okay so there's that so there has been some sort of an evolution of this neg oh, yeah. this neg entropy and now we have this and it's excellent okay great so there's that it's like the whirlpool has had is you know this the the eternal spiral but the you know we're here but then at the same time is that we're holding that perspective at the same time as we're holding the infinite screen of, the, of consciousness and that that itself is never changing parmenides and heraclitus really had from what i understand this first like 2500 years ago the first realization of both of those things coexisting at the same time and that that eternal yeah. becoming and the eternal being at the same time and like if you never divide in two then you get to that yeah 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 and that's exactly so the way i would say in, in my, my picture of the world is that in order to be an island of consciousness in order to have this kind of you know this perfect peaceful perch of awareness 
from which you can just kind of sit and observe the world, you know, in the kind of, in the best kind of meditative states, you know, if you can achieve that, um, where there is this, this kind of, yeah, it's pristine, peaceful consciousness in order to have that privilege of being able to look out of the world and have the lights turn on, you need to struggle. You need to struggle to keep yourself together. Do you, there needs to be this, this yeah. controlling and trying to make order happen and it's kind of like that's just the price of, of admission like that's that's the bind we find ourselves in and it's better, better to kind of come to terms with that sooner rather than later um, and it's also why I actually don't why I, I don't tend to think about there being some kind of um, consciousness outside of outside of this process because if there was not to be too dark but there would be no point in me continuing to live if I could live not as an organism that didn't have to feel pain and didn't have to feel hunger and all this stuff and I could still be conscious and at that I could be part of an infinite blissful kind of unified consciousness then that seems better like I don't see, this seems to be a mistake this this evolution thing this life thing it seems like a silly like you know we're going to return to the one and then be like why did we do that stupid game that that was that game what was sucked it just introduced suffering um, whereas in my picture of the world it's like yeah, this 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 funny situation we find ourselves in that it's an amazing privilege to be alive, but it's not free. It it's not trivial. It's a it's a truly kind of interesting place to find ourselves in, I think. Yeah, Sri Aurobindo says that becoming is the only being. And I and I think that's a, this is a very interesting mm, way like to that to put it is that it whatever the 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 infinite is is only becoming in infinite amount of ways and and that that exactly could be and this is kind of where i'm honing in on the logic of the infinite i'm trying again the cricket trying to imagine the big game but i do think that the logic of the infinite is that it must validate the fact that it is infinite and that it does so by creating an infinite amount of illusory finity and that we are that, you know, tatvam asi, we are that. I and my father are one. The more that you realize and embody the fact that if this is true, that we are the publishers of this, and the more that you realize that we are the publishers and the players, and that here we are playing, I think the more you live from truth the more you live from and when you and like you described earlier as well when you realize that the one i the one i one i that is experiencing it itself from through all through all of us and that the more that you embody that realization if it can you know like adi ashanti calls it you know the flickering you know you get the light it flickers a little you're like oh Ah, and then and then like slowly um it does it, it is in a sense like you said it's it's a death and a rebirth it's a it's a caterpillar into a butterfly if that light when that light and that's what it seems like we're evolving towards is that light permanently staying on that's when the being can the individual artist can no longer ever ever have any violence or even negativity not let a yeah violence at the worst negativity at even the most minuscule uh, malevolence towards another because it's you and then if we can yeah. get there as as a planet that's that's i think this this main key of the where where we're heading yeah, I mean, I, and also you said if it's true that we are the publisher as well as the player, I would say it's definitely true. Like, there's no way that we are not the same physical stuff of the universe, and 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 there's no way that the self is what we think it is. You know, to to think that you are not the main event of uh, that you are not the same thing as as the kind of ground of being that illusion kind of comes about because we take this story we tell ourselves of separation very very seriously, right? But I think the the idea of the infinite as well is really relevant because i think i think there are, we've touched on it in like two different ways i think um and there's the first way in, in the sense that which also relates to the idea with why i'm not uh, i don't believe that consciousness is the kind of ground of being is the only way the only kind of speculative way i can think about as as to why this is happening right now like why are we why is this going on why are we here would be that the kind of default of reality 
if you if you have no boundaries, nothing going on, like nothing to hem reality in, then it's infinity, right? Like that's kind of just the default. It, it, if you're going to make no assumptions, you could say there was consciousness in the beginning, but then you're like, well, where did that come from? What what gave it that structure? But if you just say there's, if you say nothing effectively, there's infinity, and in infinity, everything that can happen will happen. All the you know things will start happening, patterns will emerge. And at some point, those patterns become these patterns that open their eyes and go, what the hell's going on? Yes. Um, so that's my picture of the world is it's a lawful yes. unfolding that can be understood. Um, and there, there is no, the infinity is the beginning. There is no, it's not like there was some, some being with structure who thought I'm going to will all this into existence. I, I think it's just happening and it will happen forever because yeah. you can't you just, you can't come up with an end to infinity. It yeah. just doesn't make sense. Yep. Um, and you can also connect with that by, as you said before, like kind of sinking into the present moment, recognizing your being now, you're the nature of your mind. You know, if you say consciousness is infinite to the, to the average person, like, well, you know, you might be meaning it in the sense of it is the, the kind of infinite ground of being. But if I say consciousness is, has this quality of infinity, I, what I mean is it's not finite. It's not actually bounded into concepts in the way we think it is. We think it's divided and, and structured, and but it's actually not. It's it's I was, maybe it's maybe you should coin a new term like a finite or something as opposed to infinite, because um, infinite has this kind of I guess idea of like spatial extension and stuff. But if it's it's just it's not finite, um, and when you recognize that in yourself, you do connect with with this ground of being. And I totally get why, you know, in the best, in the kind of deepest moments of meditation, you know, you have this feeling of consciousness just kind of beholding existence and there being this wordless getting it. You just kind of get it in a way that you can't with words. And it's, if you were try, going to try and put it in words, it is something like, oh, you're me. Like, but then that's not quite right because there, there is no me. So it's more like it is, like is or something like that, right? If you, if you wanted to. But wasn't it? And I see why from there, because that's happening in consciousness, it's tempting to think, well, maybe this consciousness is me and this consciousness is everything. And I think that's where metaphysically people can kind of differ. But we should all be humble, I guess, is because like I will make claims about what we can't say and what we can say. And ultimately we're we're really way out. We're in deep waters here, I think, you know, when we're trying to label this stuff. <laughs> oh, I love this. Love this, Jay. So let's um let's hit uh, what you're going to be uh, releasing. You have the Journal of Consciousness Studies and we have that. Um, the, so tell us about what, like, what is, um, how do we test the, like the hypothesis? Cause we've been, you know, yeah, we've been talking about it so much, um, living mirrors theory. So what, what do we do for, um, uh, proper, like, is there a randomized control trial? Like, well, yeah, yeah. And, or, or do we have to use yeah. sim simulation technology to, to like, to, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. So, yeah, I would say computational modeling, like simulating and, um, would be one step, but that's going to be, I mean, you know, technology is increasing exponentially, right? So maybe it's not that far away right now. The simulations we can do are so puny we we can't simulate a single cell like it, it's too complex a, a single cell um but we can do kind of quite simple simulations with this stuff um so what would be nice would be to be able to simulate a single cell um and then so say you have a bacteria and you could effectively simulate based on its statistical physics the patterns in its environment it's survive you, you you find out its fitness functions and you model what you think its structure of its consciousness should be like you know, what dimensions of kind of photo, you know, of like light sensitivity does it have? And then you do behavioral experiments where you would, you would basically test it, flashlights, make it respond for nutrients and stuff. And just see like, does the theory predict the structure of consciousness? And that would be the kind of gold standard way of really, you know, it's not a, um, I guess, yeah, in that, in that picture, you would be able to just see like, do, does it fall out of the theory? Do, does it match up? If it doesn't match up, the theory is probably not right. Um, but the other kind of more gradual approach, which is similar is that, the the actual um the kind of mathematical basis of the theory is not some um kind of fringe you know bit of bit of science it's actually the emerging mainstream picture of how the brain works is it's been described as kind of a hierarchical inference it's like this idea of the bayesian brain it's also called the free energy principle all of this stuff is is about using exactly the same mathematics as applies to the single cell 
um, to understand how the brain works. And this, this was best fleshed out by a guy called Carl Friston, uh, who's a neuroscientist at the same university as me, who's done some wonderful work here. And, and this is, to me, is, is you know, more and more people are lining up to, to think of the brain in these terms. And so the, th the living mirror theory just fits perfectly alongside it. It just says here, whilst you're doing your neuroscience studies on the human brain, as well as just saying, okay, I know a human brain is conscious, but I, I don't know what to say about any other living system. This theory gives you a way of saying, well, alongside your experiments, you can say, this is a way of thinking about which systems are conscious, why they're conscious, where, you know, where in the universe they're conscious. And so what I hope is that people will gradually just kind of, in the same way with uh, the theory of evolution, people, there was no, there was no experiment to test it really, but the kind of gradual, just seeing how it made sense of everything, it just fit with all the data. Everyone gradually was like, oh, okay, this is the right way of thinking about it. That's where I'm at personally with being like, okay, as someone who's always been passionate about trying to understand the mystery of consciousness, you know, I've read the different things on offer and they don't, they just don't sit right with me. If they had sat right with me, you know, I would have stuck with those, but I mean, this isn't controversial. No one, you know, yeah, we're not in a situation where we think consciousness is solved, right? <laughs> like um, there is nothing where everyone's like, yep, this is definitely the answer. So that would be my, um, my hope. But it, the problem is that it really hinges on the, the radical change in humanity in the kind of consciousness of humanity that you described, like, well, you know, having more people realize what they really are. There's, there's a sense in which, so we spoke about the idea that there is this uh, evolutionary process, there is kind of becoming and, and we get more and more ability to create order and control the world. And that's what's kind of got us to where we are now. But we're living so much in that side of things we're living so much in separation and control that we have these you know societies that are structured around progress 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 you know use humans as machines to kind of to generate more material stuff and and we're not balanced enough into the kind of the being side of things when you when you're in the kind of you know the being side of things that's when you can look at a plant and say oh you're me like we're the same thing i totally gather you would be conscious so I think most humans have this kind of tunnel vision of separation where after generation and generation of, of going on this kind of progress mode with all of its kind of feelings of trauma and, and being distant from the rest of the natural world, we feel like the, the punchline of consciousness has to be that we are special, that we are different, that our separation, our felt separation from nature is a good thing ultimately because we are, it's what gives us our consciousness. It's, you know, we're these, these truly different things. But I, I think we're just, that perspective is one of this kind of stress traumatized dissociation and tunnel vision. And if we all come back into just being, we recognize our unity with nature. We, we, we would look at a plant and recognize it as an extension of, of the same thing that created us. And suddenly you're like, oh, okay, I, I get it. Plants can be conscious, that totally makes sense. And we see this in people who engage in spiritual practice or after psychedelics, and they really, they kind of see through the kind of the delusional structures in consciousness for what consciousness really is and they're brought into this being mode more um yeah and i think if so i think actually people widespread if it turns out i'm true I, I my theory is true or i'm correct i think the limiting factor will be that perspective will be people having a kind of knee-jerk reaction of like no way is, is that true because i my feeling of separation is i'm so attached to it same same thing with darwin and, and evolution right it's like don't tell me i'm the same as an ape like i don't like to hear that because uh, i have this real feeling of like not being at peace and struggling and being separate um so yeah it's quite a maybe unlike this is why consciousness is such a tricky thing to address i think because it's so close to home we have it's not only to do with what we are it's to do with what reality is and so we have such emotional investment in in what this answer is and whether it satisfies us that I think, um, unlike other problems, there's yeah, that could be a big boundary to whether or not it's ever accepted as, as correct. But also, it could be wrong. Two ways uh, to hit the ball back there. The first one is, uh, yeah, super eloquently described with the tunnel vision of separation and that slowly becoming more and more augmented and awakened uh, and harmonized, especially between um, the importance of, of seeing the, the collective symphony at the same time as seeing a unique gift and artistic contribution. Those two things together are critical. And then on the first part that you mentioned, let's talk about the mathematics here, I think this is very interesting. Chow Tang, when we had him on the show in China, he was so um, 
insightful and visionary about the fact that we are literally going to need new math to understand how life works. And I think that's so profoundly interesting because like you described, even given such extreme successes with computational capacities, how do we actually simulate the inner workings of even a single cell and how it interacts with its environment? And then how we can basically prove the idea is that, that you can prove there's like a mathematics of consciousness of that cell that when it does get a like a light source as an input that it does register that and that it makes an output and like that's the idea of a of a of a of a, an attempt at a an, a deeper living mirror theory of understanding and how a multi cell organism has like a slightly more complex mathematical computation of its of understanding its of its environment is that the general trajectory alongside what mainstream is yeah i think where we're currently at the maths is 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 coming along well actually like so this again this is mainly the work of carl friston and what's called the free energy principle um and the existing state of it is i mean it is complicated maths um and so it's but it's it's not um you know it's 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 not like inventing a whole new branch of mathematics i guess but it's uh fundamentally the the idea is that if that in order to exist you need to minimize the kind of disorder in your boundary if you don't minimize the disorder in your boundary you're not going to exist you're going to dissolve into everything else. <laughs> and if you look at that kind of physically the mathematics describing that physically it's the same you can rearrange it and it basically says that it's the same as what's called bayesian inference which is again this i mentioned the bayesian brain the idea that this is just a kind of branch of mathematics that's to do with how you build models of the world how you test it against um hypotheses how you test your hypotheses against data Data. And in my in my theory, what I should actually make clear is that the math describes the the contents of consciousness, the structure. So in this picture, you'd be able to say, okay, that primate with its three different types of photoreceptors or color sensitive photoreceptors has trichromatic vision. It has these kind of three dimensions of color, and we can map out this kind of structure. The fact of consciousness is not something that can be you know it. it that's where you need to zoom out to this kind of to the universe really to the picture of the environment and the organism and like a reflection it exists in the interaction between the the organism and its environment so the question of to go back to what you said before about can it ever be proven the idea you, you would never be able to prove this organism has consciousness this organism doesn't have consciousness this is just you know one of the features of consciousness is private right and i can speculate that you have it because your physiology is so similar to mine it would be really unsurprised it would be very surprising if you had a similar you're a similar organism without consciousness that would just seem would seem so so weird that I'm, I'm willing to grant it to you um and then with a theory you can start to think okay i'm willing to grant it to these other organisms for these reasons but there can never be you know i can never prove that you're not a robot you know like or a zombie is the kind of philosophical term for a being with, with no with no consciousness um and so the mathematics would really be making progress in terms of cashing out whether we've got a handle on how the contents are structured. But then if, if, if the theory manages to pull that off, then it's good to assume that it's, it's right in some fundamental way. Okay, so living mirror theory is heavily grounded in the mathematics of the uh, structure of consciousness. Well, no, so I, I would say the basic insight is, is just the conceptual one we said before. You can really, we could not talk about thermodynamics at all. And we could just say, if you're going to exist, you need to know what's going on around you. And I think for some people, they might think, yeah, that makes sense. Like that's a, that, that makes more sense than maybe, I don't know, saying if your brain oscillates at 40 Hertz, then you're conscious. That seems, that doesn't seem to hold any intuitive so, so, so is it, explanation. Is it, is it then fair to say that it's the mathematics of the living system and the way that it is coupled with its environment? yeah so it, yeah so so the mathematics only comes in when it when you know it was it's a scientific theory so if you want to test it you want to you want to get precise that's where it comes in but you don't need to worry about yeah the actual kind of okay you know, that level of granularity to 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 feel you've got a handle on what i'm what i'm claiming yeah yeah correct that's kind of where we started um is having the handle on it without the math, but then I see where um, where the, because I'm so interested in the actual process of getting people around the world to go, okay, 
what we're triangulating on and what 5,000 plus years of metaphysical lineages on consciousness across the world are triangulating on is the exact same thing. And um, that, that's why um, I, I want the math to, to succeed. I want the hypotheses to be uh, proven over time uh, and successfully uh, over and over and over again. Um, yeah, and that's why I ask about the math and, and the complicated process of doing the simulations of the coupling of the living system with its um, environment. And then kind of like the, the idea is that the math, you're, we're in a sense, we're watching the changes of the math. We're watching those changes to determine. In consciousness, you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. I mean, it gets a bit, uh, I need to be careful because if, if it's like you're watching, it's like you're conscious of these other things. So I, I would say, I would say the maths is the math and the theory are always just maps for the territory, right? So this is a, a picture where it's not like consciousness is just information processing. It's not like the computer analogy for the brain where you just assume it's this very thin kind of, uh, description of what's going on. It's really a body. It's like you have this real like existence that's happening right now and there's a real process. And when you have a system that believes things about in about the world around it, this is what it feels like. Um, and the theory and, and mathematical descriptions are just maps. They're just saying, here's how it should play out if we've got a really if we've got a handle on what's going on, this is what it what it should look like. Um, so the consciousness itself is is embodied in the world. And this, then the theories are just their descriptions. They're, they're a language game, ultimately, um, which is why if you if you forced me to choose between science and spirituality, I would choose to just meditate the rest of my life away <laughs> instead of uh, the, uh, cause the game of, of trying to put it into words and in other forms of languages is not as uh, it's not as real. It's it's a story. It's ultimately a story. Interesting. OK. All right. Um, I think that's a really solid amount on, um, on living mirror theory. Let's, um, mm -hmm. let's play a little bit on, um, the telos. Uh, I just want to play on this for a bit, given the fact that we are talking about simulation tech, we're given AI VR tech emerging, um, what's being unleashed with quantum computation so ultimately it seems as though the way that a tree drops seeds and those become trees and the way that a zygote makes a human and humans procreate make more humans um, the same way that a big bang makes a civilization and we make more big bangs do you see the recursion as the telos um, do you see this as a quine in a sense by telos, do you mean some kind of like purpose to the to the whole thing? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think, um, I mean, I guess I, my view, the recursion comes in, the kind of self-referential nature of things comes in with life and with, it's crucial for consciousness with, you know, because we're, we're kind of self-starting creatures. We're, um, there is no, we're both the puppeteer and the puppet, you know, of, our, of ourselves. Uh, but I see, I think I see, that's actually a really interesting prompt because I, I, I would say that I see the evolution of the universe starting at the Big Bang as rather than a kind of recursive process as quite a kind of linear process, like a kind of like a radial process of like a flower blooming or something where you have a Big Bang and then you have physics becoming, bi becoming chemistry, becoming biology, becoming life and just increasing complexity. And it's but it's this very. Um, I don't know, aesthetically, I like it as well. It makes me feel very like reassured that the world is just moving in one direction and and it makes it, things feel less loopy and, and complicated um, <laughs> than uh, the kind of quine, quine picture. Because when you, when you start getting interested in consciousness, you really can tumble down, you know, holes of solipsism and, you know, not knowing where the, where the kind of floor is um, of reality. But I would say, yeah, actually, when it comes to, so, when it comes to reality itself, <clears throat> there's a sense in which we kind of touched on earlier, you know, Newton had this idea that everything that the universe is made of little separate things, little separate bricks that are truly separate. And then with quantum mechanics, we now know it's far more like an interwoven tapestry or like a house of cards where every kind of piece is dependent on, on all the other pieces. And 
consciousness is like that as well. I think this is how you can get consciousness arising out of a physical system, because it's not like it introduces a new substance into existence, but at the level of information, a system can hold that the world is one way as opposed to another way. It can hold that something is hot versus cold, but then there are correlations with like, well, hot things tend to be more red and yellow, you know, these like long wavelengths of light rather than kind of blues and greens. In this kind of self-referential process, you build up consciousness. You, you, you get this kind of house of cards of more of this, less of that. And this is kind of touched on the Buddhist concept of emptiness. When you, in the West, we have ideas of qualia, the idea that redness is a thing. Like it, the idea of qualia was supposed to be like an atom of consciousness, which I think should sound like a kind of nonsense idea. It, red is only red with respect to everything else in consciousness. You can't isolate it and have just, just red. Um, and so this is the Buddhist concept of emptiness. That if you really look at red for long enough, it loses any sense of any intrinsic essence. It's all just this kind of mirage of, of relative relative change. So I'd say in that sense, I don't know if that's precisely in the way you mean this kind of this kind of self-referential structure, but I think, yeah, everything emerges in this in this way, and it, and it's part it's a feature of a holistic picture of things, a holistic nature of consciousness and the holistic nature of the physical world as well. In in inevitably it's going to happen with the West becoming uh, more and more, and even China, you know, Japan is a canary in the coal mine in many ways with humans passing. I don't know if you've seen the husk, but the husk is the, the contraption now for, for the ultimate uh, unit where you're literally just, you know, you got your bed, you got your computer, you got your controller, your, your, you know, you got your whole setup and, and soon it's just, you know, it's right in it's, it's, it's connected directly in and, and you're, it, it, if you don't put on VR, and use it for 30 minutes and then take it off and think to yourself, how am I not already in VR? Then you, <laughs> then you don't know. But if you do have that process, you take it off and you, in, and you make the self inquiry and you go, how, how is this not already VR? Then you know. And I, and, and I think that, that that is the essence of where um, the modernized world is pushing and that the modernized world is going to triangulate on the exact same realization that 5,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago from everywhere across the world, it's a perennial spiritual wisdom um, it has been triangulating on. So, so um, we'll see. And I, and I do think that John Smart's transcension hypothesis has a lot of, um, of potential uh, as well. Um, we've hit on so many awesome things. I want to um, <clears throat> I want to talk about this for a bit. I think that you know you've had incredible guests on your show already. I highly recommend you guys to go and check out James's podcast. He's crushing it. Check out his YouTube channel. Um, Christoph Koch episode was so good. So was um, you know Donald Huffman. Both such great episodes. If we take um, if we take Hoffman's perspective for a little bit, we were talking about this a, li a bit before we started. Um, it seems like a multimodal user interface and the video game analogy we were just talking about a moment ago, um, those are basically anyone that has, anyone that goes through that process of self-inquiry we were just talking about inevitably comes to the realization that they themselves have a, uh, a user interface that they are they're in a reality they have a they have this user interface there are um there are fitness functions you know that if you if you eat um a a, a bucket of ice cream um you're gonna feel like shit and that you're gonna feel like shit the next day and that you're probably shaving um could be shaving a day or two or even a week off of your longevity um and now versus if you eat a salad you're going to feel great you'll feel great tomorrow you'll you might you know have an extra week on so there's there's there are um there are these uh, these understandings of um of what you do in this 
in this reality um, is going to inevitably um, make you more peaceful, more happy, uh, a, a better mate, um, more knowledge about truth, more um, uh, a better better mate for procreation. So the 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 I and I'm I'm also curious where living mirrors theory could potentially um, synthesis with the multimodal user interface because in a sense that's what the cell does have the cell has a a, a, a ledger a ledger and an understanding of of the world and then it's constantly updating that based on fitness so do you, you see a synthesis of of Hoffman and and you in in a sense as well I can see your head nodding. <laughs> Yeah, I um so I think that's a really really important point. So um yeah, I would say when so when I was an undergrad, when I first was kind of introduced to psychology and neuroscience, it was taught kind of um that it was kind of a fact or almost almost a, a point of definition that colors are not out there in the world. Beauty is not out there in the world. Things are not objectively colorful, objectively beautiful. Um those are qualities that exist in consciousness. And this was just like day one of like talking about perception. Let's get our <laughs> definition straight. If your know, leaves are not green, you perceive them to be green, but that's, that's in consciousness, right? Um, so when I first saw Donald Hoffman's theory, it took me a while to, to understand what he was saying was radical because when, I, when he says a case against reality is the name of his book, and he was saying the world isn't actually full of these colors. I was like, well, that's, that's a fact basically. Like, I think if you're thinking about the world the right way, it's, that's, that's something, yeah that's true but then he it turns out he's saying something far more radical that like you know the moon isn't there when you're not looking at it that kind of thing i think there's something even though it's not um it doesn't have the same appearance like appearances happen in consciousness i think there's some structure out there in the world that persists when when we're not looking at it but um but yeah so so this idea that conscious the contents of consciousness are absolutely and i would maybe say only tied to fitness payoffs is the term that hoffman uses but like um so there's structure in the world and you perceive, you know, when you're hungry, you perceive certain food to be appetizing and delicious. And when you're not hungry, you know, if you eat too much chocolate, then the same thing can now appear disgusting, right? Like your conscious perception, <laughs> the attribute of the thing in the world has changed. Yet it's not like physicists have to account for some, you know, um, some atom that decays from like nice atom to disgusting atom you know that's not how we think about the kind of disgustingness or appetizingness of the chocolate being out there in the world same is true for color same is true uh for all these other things which is you know that that's that was the way i was thinking about consciousness when i came up with my theory because in my theory it's absolutely entirely tied up with the organism's survival um and the contents of consciousness are, are completely tied up with with what you might call fitness payoffs um and also i think to just get a, a feeling of this kind of the fact that what you perceive is an interface for the world, you know, like um, if you perceive, you know, based on your history and, and your kind of genetics and stuff, you might perceive certain foods to be appealing because, because of that history and because it, it makes sense for you. And in the same way, like, you know, imagine if, as well as us becoming this intelligent, technologically advanced civilization, imagine if slugs had as well. And you had, you know, slug Hollywood celebrities who all the slugs agree were the most beautiful perfect you know things they thought they were like objectively beautiful i don't think i would be agreeing that the slug hollywood celebrities are objectively beautiful right and that's that's a way of seeing that the perception the conscious perception of, of beauty is is not out there in the world and and as weird as it sounds it's true for all of our our senses and we saw this with the the hysteria around um that dress that went viral the kind i was of black gonna talk to you about dress, it right? beautiful Good, it's thank a perfect you. example i was very excited when that came up because so i was like this is Likewise. what i'm interested in it's, and this points to something fascinating about the it nature does. of reality exactly that, like you're poised on understanding something but then the then the media kind of took it in a far more like no no it's just this this kind of you know some more kind of a less radical kind of uh, ways of it's like the, the biggest yeah, metaphysical you know, thing and, and yeah <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly and it and it's what you can do from that point and the same thing was with that um that sound clip of Yanni versus Laurel. Okay, People heard it as yeah. these two different words, right? What you can, can realize that is that what you're seeing is not 
perception is not like you're looking out of these transparent eyeballs to a, a freestanding world. J just James, just one given. quick it's thing. Just the way it is. Just one quick thing on mm -hmm. that is that you can change your um, perception to on the Laurel Yanny, but you because you can you can go back and forth yeah. like the Ruben. Um, uh, vase or the Necker cube, um, but on uh, you can go back and forth. But on the um, uh, the dress, I, I, you can't. At least um, from what I've tested with people, they can't go back and forth between gold and white and um, black and blue. Which that I think is the most profound part of of it. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, yeah. But, I mean, yeah. It's, yeah. No, but that's interesting in its own right. I think it might be to do with the fact that, like with the with the the vase face illusion, where it kind of changes, there's some structure there that you can scan your attention around, and you can you have some model in your head of the two things, and you can you can kind of actively engage with the process. Same with the Annie and Laurel. You can really try and focus on the high notes that sound like Yanni and all the low notes sound like Laurel. With the dress, it's more. I think <laughs> the the thing that seems to account for which way you go is is if you think you're discounting blue light or yellow light. I read one thing that's, I don't know if it was actually uh, real data or if it was just speculation, but there was this speculation that that men would see it um, as, I think it was black and, and blue, oh no, sorry, yellow and um, gold and white, because they played more computer games with blue lights. So their brain is used to being like, oh, like the room's drenched in blue light. I better discount some blue. Yeah. And then it pushes it in that direction. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know if that's, that's was actually proven, but that's, I think that might be why it, it moves that way. But, uh, but yeah, so what it shows you though, is that this is not a pre-given world that looks the way it looks. There is a, a screen of there's consciousness and there's all these weird appearances inside it and you are you are just another one of these appearances you know when i'm looking at my hand it feels like this hand is inside me but actually it's appearing in consciousness it's it's visually continuous with the rest of the background and that's when you can your kind of sense of self can blink out of existence and there can just be this kind of light of consciousness and a bunch of phenomena happening and you can realize that fundamentally that's what's going on and there's a delusion when you 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 know you take this bundle of perceptions and you say this is me these appearances of hands are, are me and you know i'm saying there is an organism but the organism is not the same thing as the concept of the self and it's the concept of the self that all of our suffering is is fed through you know this was the kind of buddha's insight that but that um, neuroscience is now kind of showing to be true as well right so it could be fair to say that there is a um, within the living mirror theory, there is a, um, uh, the living system has its, uh, a coupling with the environment. And in that process, the multimodal user interface is what the living system uses. So there's that, that's kind of what the synthesis could yeah, be. Yeah. And I would say actually it's kind of important to the interface idea is actually important because Consciousness is not like you're being aware of the thing out there. What it is, is the thing out there is utterly beyond your boundary. You know, like you're here as this kind of bounded physical system. Photons might fall on your retina, but you know, your insides, your brain, everything else is just utterly in the dark. And so consciousness is this active, creative, generative kind of hallucinatory process. And when you understand that the world doesn't have an appearance, it kind of gives you an appreciation as to why it's possible for consciousness to exist because it's not it's not like um there's a thing and i have a symbol for the thing and how does my symbol become conscious that's how a lot of people think about this stuff that you know it's the kind of computer analogy it's like there's some symbol over here and there's some real thing over here like say that there's a green object and there's a symbol saying green why does this symbol become conscious whereas in a computer computer it doesn't why doesn't the word green when i write it down why doesn't that become conscious whereas i'm saying no like there is no green thing there's patterns and then your consciousness is this fundamentally you're generating yeah like a simulation generating an, an interface of beliefs about the way the world is that is this kind of house of cards of like uh saying it's this way as opposed to this way so it's, it's entirely uh generated within the organism well through interacting with its environment but it's it's not um the, the, each each percept is is only cashed out in reference to all the other percepts. This is like relativistic framework. I, I've I've really appreciated um, a way of um, of perceiving it regarding um, when you're when you're under when you're at a uh, 
an event where you're, you know, you're, <clears throat> you're at whether it, it does literally just take any uh, sports or music style event in a stadium and it, you're going to have a different point of view than somebody sitting across the stadium. And when, when you also register that um, you're going to get that at a, at a deeper level that it's not some, um, uh, that, that you, in when you got to play game, I feel like you gotta, if you really dive in, like we didn't have the tool of games, we had it, but we didn't have, you know, this is the game changer is that when you, it's literally the screen, like the screen as an analogy, the game as an analogy to this is exactly what makes us realize that when I go into the, 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 the first person perspective in, 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 and I'm playing and I'm playing the game and I'm, and I'm walking around in the, in the simulated world. And I have this, the, the relationship between me as a living system and my environment and my interface and all, <clears throat> all of the all of the stuff that i have in my parcel that i'm my that i'm carrying around with me and that i have these quests and these objectives and that the, the more that you kind of follow that uh, train of thinking the more that you're going to realize that james is also a player and james also has his little um, world that that james is playing in as well and james is going to see things like you are you, is it, is that it? Are you, is that your girlfriend or is that the fiance or wife? What level are, are wife, you? Yeah. Wife. Okay. <laughs> wife, wife. Well, what, what's her name? Hey, Rebecca. Rebecca. So um, that, you know, you have a wife, you have, you know, you have a wife, you have Rebecca, like you, you have like, you have that in your life. I don't have like a wife. So like my, like the fact that we like that you have a wife and I don't like, that is like a significant reality changer. And so um, like, that's like, that's something to like, keep in mind, like somebody that's living in a completely different country is basically on, in a sense, their reality has a significantly different, um, like you're in, you're mostly in London and in the mountains of Portugal. And so you're, you're inevitably going to have a different map than uh, California in the Midwest and stuff like that. So, um, but, but, but there's also, there's some, there's a synthesis between if we don't break it down in two, there's a synthesis where it's like, in order for us to um, have this zoom call, we have to respect the objectivity of the science that is occurring, that is enabling the, um, the, the computation, the, um, the, the, the electromagnetic communication, um, so you, 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 you have a, a, a synthesis that's going on. If we want to agree that the H2O molecule, um, looks a specific way or that the, the cellular respiration and, um, and the oxygen cycle on the planet happens a specific way for, for, for every person that inhales the, the O2, I think that that, that there's going to be a, a synthesis between those, um, those individual gamers uh, in their worlds with the fact that all of those gamers are inhaling um, O2 and their hearts are beating a hundred thousand times a day, stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. I think um, also the idea of being the kind of gamer with the headset on, you, you mentioned earlier the kind of simulation stuff, um, which obviously is the name of the podcast as well. So maybe it's relevant to, <laughs> to touch on that. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it's interesting that I, I guess it's not something I've dwelt on very much because um, I think it's the, uh, the thing we spoke about before where I was saying like, as a scientist, it's like, I'll map out what I, what's within my domain. Like, so the, for, before the big bang, we might be, you know, I, I mentioned earlier ways of thinking about why anything's happening at all. And I'm happy to speculate about that. But then, you know, like what happened for the big bang is just kind of outside my window. Um, what, you know, what happens in the future is as well. Uh, so I, I, I think like, I guess I see science as mapping out this little space we're in now. And most people think it's the entire space, right? They think big bang, this thing and that's it. I I suspect there's you know like why wouldn't there be vast amounts of stuff going on outside of our, our window? I see no you know reason why you wouldn't think whether you want to call them multiverses or simulations within simulations within simulations. To me that seems absolutely you know if not 
um, plausible likely, you know, that something weird is happening. Um, before, uh, I think before certain psychedelic experiences, I would have said, there's no reason to speculate. Like it's just, it's speculation. <laughs> it's like saying, am I a solipsist? And then you can have experiences where you, you seem to wake up from the simulation and that, <laughs> that definitely gives you that kind of strange loop idea of like, wait, like, uh, is this some, is this simulations all the way down? And, you know, you can kind of tumble through them through in some way. But I, I think I ultimately come back to kind of knowing my place as a scientist and, and thinking I'm going to, if this is a simulation, it's a beautiful, pretty complex simulation that's really relevant for our day-to-day -day living. So I'm going to try and understand this one as best as I can. If at the end I wake up, take my headset off and go, wow, I can't believe that was a game. Uh, I don't think I'll, have, uh, I'll feel like I've wasted my time in trying to, <laughs> trying to understand the game. Yeah, and which plays very beautifully into what we mentioned uh, earlier on uh, infinity, making a infinite amount of illusory finity and that plays into the multiverse um, perfectly. Um, there's just, and, and it also plays perfectly in the sense of if you believe in yourself as infinite potential, that there is um, every single possibility of you and uh, is happening right now. And, and also every single possibility <clears throat> in a, <clears throat> in a non-anthropocentric uh, way is also happening. So when you see all of these designer worlds that the video game artists are making, all of those are happening as well. And we ourselves are going to become more and more like designers of worlds. And we ourselves are going to come to the realization more and more of what infinity truly is. Yeah. I think that, that thing you said about our nature is infinite possibility. Like I've been reflecting recently on, I'm not trying to put this into words, but there's a, so I'm, I, I don't believe, I believe that kind of, organism level um to use that term uh libertarian free will the idea that you know we can we can really choose exactly what we want to do with no prior causes kind of causing it i think that's an illusion and it's a kind of it's trying to kind of make ourselves feel comfortable in our in our feeling of separation but if you look at the kind of the the, the freedom of the totality of existence and you consider the way that particles interact and anything happens from that perspective everything the way that things interact is the perfect choice given what they are. Like this is kind of what a scientific picture of the world is. It's like a lawful thing. It's like given these things and their forces and, and what they are in themselves, they will, they, the universe is utterly free to do exactly what is the most like lawful or most um, appropriate thing for it to do. So you can think of, of when you identify with all of reality as there being this kind of ultimate freedom ultimate creative fulfillment of the process just just moving forward in terms of what it is and what's best for what it is which is another way of describing determinism which is a weird thing to say is that like that you know from one side from the human idea of separation the idea of the universe deciding everything is like oh no that seems scary that seems like you know i don't like that idea um but the idea of the universe being ultimately free and therefore manifesting its what is most within its own nature is, I think, is a really, yeah, it, 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 it to me, it gives a scientific way of, uh, maybe it's the scientific language I'm adding to what you just said about identifying that kind of infinite potential, identifying with that. And you're spot on too. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you uh, made content. Again, everybody check out James's channel. Um, I'm glad that you made content specifically about your entheogenic experiences. I think that's extremely important. The more that um, people feel like they are comfortable, it's almost like a, we're, we're having a, a, a species coming out of the closet, uh, in a sense, around... Yeah around the use of uh, unleashing the divine within via these sacred secretions um, of the planet. And, and it's, it's extremely important. I'm glad that you've made content about it. You've been vulnerable about it. I think it's very important. Um, and that's also gonna triangulate right on that, that same nature of reality. What, what are you and Rebecca doing with um, the homestead, um, Surrender Homestead? What are you guys doing with that? Um, I know you, you guys are just starting with it and 
Like it, it, it sounds so beautiful. Like literally when I was researching you, um, I went to like, I started like Google earthing Portugal and like looking at where, <laughs> like where, like, and I was looking at like the temperatures and the culture and the GDP and the living standards. And like, it's beautiful. Like, it's amazing. I've been yeah, to- you saw why we chose that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So tell us about uh, the Surrender Homestead. Yeah, so um, it fits very much with what you just said about how, um, you know, like I don't, I, I guess I'm not fundamentally identified as a scientist who's doing this. I, I'm fundamentally just a person who's trying to be honest about what I see as important in the world. And when it comes to, for me, like being open about spiritual stuff was also a kind of taboo in this kind of scientific circles I moved in. But I kind of, I think it's just within me that I, I think I've always had just a feeling of, if I hold true to what I think is authentic and real and, and, you know, like, and true, and, I, and I'm just truthful about it. Um, if people don't get it or if culture isn't, is, isn't ready, then culture isn't ready. Like that's not my problem. You know, if I'm, if I uh, take some magic mushrooms and society says that's an illegal activity, that's bad, you know, I can give up, I can absolutely give account as to why I do it, why I think it's, it's not harmful, why I think it's incredibly beneficial. Right. So, the, that's also that same logic and the same with vulnerability you know with trying to you know I, I want to live in a world where especially for like men can can be more vulnerable emotionally yes. and it would be it would be a bit rich for me to not then put myself out there and say like look this is this is who I am I you know I'm going to try and live from a place of, of truth um and yeah so it makes life a lot easier as well if you just <laughs> if you just don't hold anything back um so then when it comes to the surrender homestead we have a bunch of different ideas of what we want to do. We'd love to maybe host retreats, like, you know, maybe ayahuasca retreats, stuff like that. Um, we also, my, my wife really wants it to be a kind of artist residency, a place people can come and just create and just have like studios and we're just in nature. So people can just kind of connect with nature and, and all that kind of good stuff. But yeah, we're in, we're in the early stages. We're kind of renovating. We bought this big bit of land. We're renovating an old, an old farmhouse. But the fact that we kind of find ourselves here is really, because of the same thing we just spoke about and, and because my wife's in the same wavelength of being like well we're humans you know humans are these creatures that are born into nature we're, we're supposed to be in nature we're supposed to create like this is what's good for us to exercise you know be in the sunshine and yeah. we spent our years you know in london and these places like you know you know tr working hard to establish ourselves but there was always this feeling of like society is a bit of a crazy <laughs> it's it's a, it's sick in many ways i would say and so the fact that we find ourselves here is fundamentally living from that place of authenticity of being like this is where we we would prefer to be will and and the thing you said of like potential like we know being here will lead to something good like we may not be able to say next year we're going to hold an ayahuasca retreat or next year we're going to be open to accept artists for residency but we know something's going to happen we know yeah. people you know like we're in a beautiful location we have you know intention to share it with people in some capacity so yeah. so yeah keep it keep an eye on i think the surrender homestead on instagram is our best place to keep up with us um if you want to see us assembling composting toilets and stuff like that as well <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. um, so so beautifully said we have the economic machinery that is uh producing so much excellence and also so much um deterioration and so to wake up to archiving the codes that are deteriorating and amplifying the codes that are making things better in that machinery and also building you know cities 2.0 because people love urban centers so time to build those up into the 2.0 category and also um especially with our ecology bringing together architecture and ecology but um sustainability but also having places where we literally just go, no, like, it, like, I don't want to be in city 2.0. I want to be in, um, in extreme. I want to be in the most extreme nature setting. Like sometimes we've envisioned this on the show where you literally can take, like, could you, could you take and build out, um, a beautiful like augmented reality creative space in the middle of the redwoods in California um, or right on the Pacific Ocean um, or the Atlantic in Portugal. You know, there's, there's all of these interesting ways to like embed um, 
kind of the like and you can just turn off that augmented reality space whenever you want and you're just back at the pacific or the atlantic or the redwoods or whatever so um it like to be able to instantaneously ebb and flow between the the two is is, is going to be very important. I'm excited that you guys are building it out. I think it's very, it's a very important project from the heart to do and you want to share, which is very important. And you're going to, you're going to inspire a lot of people by doing that. Um, you already inspired me and many viewers by doing that and hopefully, you know, follow along on, on Instagram and, uh, and maybe within, you know, who knows 2021 could be some sort of cool, um, opening of, of, a yeah. of a, yeah, of an event or, you know, I love our artists and residencies are going to be very important. Um, just briefly on the scientific dogma, I think spirituality also has spiritual dogma where there's no interest in science um, and the scientific method. Uh, so I think that when you go extreme uh, kairos on spirituality, you lose all chronos. And when you go extreme chronos on science, you lose all kairos of uh, spirituality. And so those dogmatic circles um, need to, in a sense, realize that they do not represent the essence of the nature of reality, which is to drop the silos and to more harmoniously merge. Um, so that's in essence what the science and spirituality, and that's why you're doing what you're doing and why we're doing what we're doing. Cause yeah, there is no dividing into two. It's, it is just the one. Yeah. yeah. I think um, that's also, yeah, a really good point that again, all these things are maps, you know, like the reality has no, there is no God's eye view where we can say, this is the correct answer. turns out science is right. Or turns out spirituality is right. They're different angles different perspectives like you were saying in the stadium like you're looking at this this beautiful diamond of existence from all these different angles and i think again i think it's the the this the the pro the, the process of creation and and control and separation is can often be the thing that fuels kind of fear and and investment in the identity and tribalism and and dogma and basically being like i'm a scientist over here because i feel uncomfortable when people talk about Woo woo spirituality stuff. So I'm gonna just assume it's all nonsense and, and you know, and then we hold on to our worldviews like these blankets, right? And we're not and again, that's what we spoke about <laughs> earlier with consciousness. And like I think it's gonna be a real uphill battle to to convince this generation of scientists that that plants might be conscious. There are lots of plant scientists who think think they are. But um yeah, I think there was a Stephen Hawking quote that I'm not gonna be able to remember, but it was something to do with like like uh scientific revolutions only happen when like each generation dies effectively <laughs> like when there's a new generation coming up to to hear new, new ideas afresh and you know take them on board and i, guess, I think that's because of this emotional attachment um that yeah. you form quite early i guess to ideas my gosh the blanket analogy is very strong there it is it's a uh, it's the sense of uh, of really being warm like it's almost like not wanting to get out of bed in the morning because that that blanket is so warm and if you take the blanket off and you expose yourself to the 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 forces the cold um in in the sense of you're on the you're on the hunt again to try and augment the blankets and try and make a really strong hammock for for you to be able to you know lay in and enjoy it it's it's good to think of of yourself as as wanting to and the same thing with the layers of the onion is another way to view is like do you shed each one of those layers and get back to what is the most fundamental of our existence that shared consciousness shared awareness and that also that is the 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 realization slowly that we have the different maps of science spirituality. Yeah, it's been it's been really solid back and forth on this. And I, James, another thing is I just really appreciate the fact that um, one of the things with this big synthesis that I'm passionate about is just at least um, whether I'm right or I'm wrong, at least I have tried. That's what's most important, I think, because with um, living mirror theory of consciousness, it's the same thing. Every single person, whether they're ultimately, you know, right or wrong, or that they're at least moving the foundation of thinking forward, they're ultimately at least trying. And in order to break through from being like, 
it, the fear, right? Like Wayne Gretzky, of you're going to miss every shot you don't take. You have to take the shots. So you're going to take the, we're going to take these shots and at least we're going to push further. So I just congratulate the fact that you pushed and made this and that you're publishing and that you're going to move forward with it on experientially with proving hypotheses. So thank you for inspiring people um, to, to do so. Thank you. But it's interesting because I, I, maybe it's because I've been so weighted towards that side of, of creating like that, but where my head is at now is actually kind of on emphasizing the other side of it, which is the kind of being, you know, we were talking about this division between kind yeah. of striving, becoming like doing. And I, um, in the past, I would have been, I would have very gladly just said like, thank you very much. You know, like that's, uh, I, you know, I, nice to be recognized for that. But where I'm at now is I would say like, um, most people like if we if we had more people who are interested in the experiential side of things like cultivating compassion working through their own traumas and stuff like i could i could happily live in a world without science without you know where we kind of move back to a far simpler way of life you know just like living close to nature um you know I, so I, I don't believe in progress for for progress's own sake and it's interesting that i i see in myself and in a lot of other scientists i think a kind of um we spoke about the kind of emotional currents underpinning science. I think a lot of people who get interested in kind of science and philosophy of things like consciousness comes out of some quite deep existential anguish of some kind, you know? And I think for me, there was, there was a kind of very early kind of being physically unsafe as a child was kind of like, is what made me just be like, okay, what's going on? I need to figure out what's going on. And suddenly you're living up in your head and you're like, your mind is racing to figure out what's going on in the world. And I think this isn't something I see spoken about that I think a lot of very talented philosophers, very talented scientists also like should be, when it comes to like psychedelic medicine being made legal, they should be like high up on the list of people to tap them on the shoulder and go like, good work, figuring out all that stuff. But maybe you want to go and have a bit of psilocybin therapy and see if there might be some, some fire that's, that's driving you unconsciously and that maybe you might be happier without your mind racing all the time because for me that's that's kind of what's happened and that's why i'm here really is is moving you know i'm still continuing to communicate and think about this stuff and i'm not just gonna you know switch off from the science but i i definitely this is coming from someone who i think has always been a bit imbalanced and is finding balance and and sees we live in a culture that praises progress so much that i think it's worth saying that like it's not intrinsically yes. valuable it's you know it comes in a in a context of striving for because you're not happy i think beautifully beautifully put that yes we're gonna have a, a long-term synthesis of as you can say like the masculine the feminine the science the spirituality the uh the kairos with the chronos like it's just inevitably um going to be uh a a deeper more harmony harmony is always this key word a harmony a harmony um okay let's wrap um beautiful like man i just i am just so passionate about the inquiry that you have um and that it's inspiring me and i hope other people as well and and also it's balanced with the also the deep uh the press that you've had to 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 embody from in your in your heart and to 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 explore what has been who are you individually and what has been what has affected you and um i think that i think that you are in fact a, a very beautiful person that you have a very beautiful story that you have a like james i'm very grateful thank you for coming on the program yeah for that i'll say thanks very much <laughs> no qualification for me on that <laughs> <laughs> no, I, i'm so i'm so grateful that we got this chance to to talk and to get to know each other deeper i'm super grateful and yeah same yeah. Yeah. And I would, I would highly uh, suggest everybody, thank you for tuning in. First of all, we greatly appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do your best uh, to, to, to tune into what James is um, putting out. James says so many good links now in his bio, go and check those out. He's got his website where he's got all of his resources. Um, but also he has his YouTube channel, 
excellent conversations. Check those out. Also, the Reality Sandwich um, profile is very good where he has his writings. Um, the writings are very short and sweet and they get to the point. And um, I think you, you, have a, you, have, you have a very strong synthesis ability, which I, I like a lot of compression of key points. Um, so check those out, everybody. Also support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the scientists, the spiritual leaders in your communities that you believe in, support them and help them flourish. Uh, you can find all of the links to simulation in the bio below if you'd like to help support us. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in. We'll see you soon. Peace. Thank you.